Chapter 33. Crusaders. I am impervious to such corrupting ambitions. Rain. What had started out as the light drizzle in the morning was a gusty downpour by early afternoon, with ambitions towards brutal indulging by the evening. Manhattan ruins matched the clouds above in the montage of gray on gray, made hazy by a screen of precipitation. Raindrops barded the puddles on the roof of Temponi Tower, swelling them until their edges pushed together, kissing and coupling into a mixture, miniature lakes. Xena's hooves splashed through them as she carried out the last of our supplies across to the sky bandits. I watched as she rose up on her hind hooves and passed the bag to Calamity, who stored it inside. My gaze lingered on her, taking in the stripes that covered her back, rippling as she a little as the muscles beneath her coat moved. I had to agree with homage. I liked her better this way. As pleased as I was to give her the opportunity to shop and mingle amongst the ponies of Temponi Tower, I was happy to see her stripes again. Removing the dye had been a little more difficult than I had anticipated. It would yet have taken weeks for her coat to resume its color, naturally, or multiple herb baths that would be depleting supplies Zenith insisted were best kept for their uses. So we sought out Life Bloom, hoping he might know a spell that could remove false coloring. Fortunately, he did, and he offered to teach it to us, for a small fee. Without having to jump to the opportunity, she was certain that the spell could fall within the boundaries of her magical prowess. Cosmetic magic was at least tangentially related to the medical and entertainment spells that came naturally to her, after all. I recalled how easily she had cleaned the Sky Bandit with her magic once. I expected her or this to be even easier. But while Velvet was coupling or capable of casting the spell, it proved surprisingly taxing for her and yielded somewhat limited events. The dye only faded enough to turn Zenith's once white coat a muddy gray. I gave it my best effort, but in vain. My horn would not even uh, design to glow as I poured my concentration into the spell. In the end, we had to pay Life Bloom to cast it himself. You're staring at her ass, aren't you? Homage whispered in my ear, starting with me just as my gaze slid down to linger on Zenith's rear. My eyes shot up in alarm, or ears shot up in alarm, and I felt myself blushing as I stammered, what? No, I was just plotting. That's it. With the plan and the plot and things. Thomas chuckled. Sure you were. Adopting a musing tone, the gray unicorn teased softly. Next time, I'll try to give you those instructions you wanted. I blushed harder, thankful that she wasn't speaking loudly enough for my friends to hear. Although I'm not sure how. You're such a delightfully sensitive thing that I might demonstrate on you. You have a hard time focusing on the lesson. Luna's mercy. My ears were burning. And I'll admit, it would be difficult for me to concentrate as well. How much leaned close? I whispered in my ear. Maybe bringing a third party would be in order. Zenith, perhaps? I felt myself splash into the puddle before I realized my legs had gone off from under me. The rooftop water was cold and soaked beneath my armor, getting trapped against my coat and skin. How much giggled? She was joking, of course. She had to be. As I picked myself up, my mind had already dug out half a dozen reasons why a threesome with Zenith was out of the question. Not the least of which being that the striped mare didn't like to be touched. The little gray unicorn had planted the seeds of a fantasy in my head now, knowing it would not make my time away from her any easier. I shot homage in an annoying glare. Deciding this was probably her revenge for my having responded to one of her favorite toys with such a lack of enthusiasm. You're just a little bit evil, I hissed. You know that, right? What's this? I asked Velvet Remedy, floating some sort of railing onto the roof of the Sky Bandit. Luggage rack, sorta. Calamity said, as he landed on top of the rail-slicked passenger wagon, and begun to tug straps tight. I figured 
the way Steel Hooves took on that star spawn thing while standing on the roof worked out mighty good. Setting up a mountain position for a pony to ride a topside. If I ever need to do some fancy maneuvering. As Clemmy pulled a little wider out of his saddlebag, or welder out of his saddlebags, the reward, I assumed, of recent bartering, Velvet Remedy primly added. It could also carry luggage. Putting down the welder and checking his work, Clemmy suggested, I reckon it won't hurt to put some armor on here too. It would slow us down, and I'd have to take breaks more often. But some ablative plates would make her a whole lot safer. I got the feeling Calamity was expecting a fight. I didn't know it was coming. Was this part of the plan to deal with the goddess? Something I had made sure that I would not be aware of? Or maybe this had to do with his new concern regarding the Enclave. If it was the former, we would be better off if I didn't ask him about it. Pressing the issue would leave him in the uncomfortable position of not having to lie to me. Worse, I could cause him to slip and give away something important. I would just have to trust him. My thoughts flickered back to the memory orbs I had viewed yesterday. According to Calamity, I had told him it was safe for me to view them. Had I known about them, I would have been driven to distraction by curiosity. But I had not been aware of them until Calamity had set them on the table and started to roll them towards me. Now I wondered if this was just a gift to myself, or if there was some special piece of information in those orbs I felt he needed to know. The first orb held a potential wealth of information. Two elements stood out amongst the others. The first being the vision of the Black Book. Clearly, the Black Book itself was a soul jar. At first, I wondered if Rarity herself had made it one, but I dismissed the idea quickly. Far more likely, it had been infused with the soul of a mad zebra alchemist who had written it. If the zebras feared and loathed everything they associated with the stars, and the Black Book was supposedly dedicated to the mad zebra in dreams. This explained how the book could have survived destruction of generations, four generations, in zebra hands before finding its way there. And it would certainly have enhanced and given credence to the darkest legends that formed around it. Furthermore, I recalled that soul jars could have other magic hung on them. Who know what magical effects the Black Book might be asserting over any pony in its vicinity. The other aspect of the orb, which stood out to me, was the conversation between Rainbow Dash and those three bucks. In that argument, I witnessed the beginning of the Enclave. The orb spoke to a spreading sentiment amongst the Pegasi ponies, a resentment of their sacrifices in the war that they believed themselves literally above, that had even reached the heart of at least one Pegasus in a position of power. One who would be killed if the first Zebra Megaspell annihilated Cloudsdale. And with it, an acknowledgement that Rainbow Dash, hero of the war, leader of the Shadow Bolts, had become a driving force behind the Pegasi's escalating involvement in the fighting. I recalled the news article in the Philadelphia Ministry of Image, Hub, in response to the Zebra's recruitment of dragons Moonet intended to strengthen Equestria's Pegasi forces. Rainbow Dash's new powered armor, I suspected, was at least one part of that. Rainbow Dash had become an icon for Pegasi participation too, both to those who supported it and those who had grown to despise it. The Dashites were the almost foregone conclusion. The isolation at the core of the Enclave was at odds with Calamity's worries. Unless, unless they threaten the gardens of Equestria. I see fear shot through my body at the idea. But if that was true, surely that wasn't something I'd want to forget. I would need to act on it immediately. No pony would keep me from joining Spike in his defense of that cave. Least of all, myself. The second orb had been a deeply bittersweet experience. I felt much happiness and sadness at seeing the five mares I had grown to know and love in a warmer and happier time. A spring before the summer of war that would bring such heartache and horror to them all. They had stood on the precipice of something terrible, and they had loved and laughed and danced. The memory 
to the best I could see, was of no strategic value. This was not the first I had heard of their mission to the buffalo, although, now, I had much more context. Instead, this was a vision into the beauty of the past, a reminder of what ponies had been, and what, I prayed, could, would, one day be again. Prayer alone is not enough, I muttered to myself. No. For our world to change, there had to be action. There had to be ponies who would stand up to the darkness and stare it down. I had to be such a pony. Hmm? Homage said, standing next to me again. I was so soaked by the rain, now that the discomfort from the puddle earlier had been forgotten. You look lost in thought so deep you could be in a memory orb. I grimaced. I reached into my saddlebags and floated out the ditzy dew orb, passing it to Homage. I want you to have this, I told her. You've been my voice in the darkness, more than once. If things ever get too bleak for you to find to find your way to hope, watch this. Let her be your guide back. Homage cocked her head cautiously. With half-lidded eyes, she whispered, I won't need it. You are my guide. But she slipped a telekinetic blanket of her own around the gift, taking it away. I would fight to make that bright and innocent past our future once again, <clears throat> I said, turning to her. Even if it means dashing myself against the evils and cruelty of this wasteland until there is nothing left for me. Like the ponies who had cracked and shattered their hooves pounding at the sealed door of Stable 2, I would persevere, making Equestria into a better place, one battle at a time, until there was nothing left for me to give. And then, when I'm too broken to go on, I will flow my dying body right down the throat of the darkness and make it choke on me. Homage gave a sad, knowing look, then leaned forward and nuzzled my cheek softly. Forcing a smile, I chuckled. Or, you know, this could all end in sunshine and rainbows. No need to get pessimistic. Homage laughed despite the tears that had begun to well up in her eyes. Or maybe that was just the way, rain. Speaking of orbs, I said, changing the subject. Homage blinked in the rain and smiled wanely. Got it. If they want to see your memories in order to get to know you, then they need to have as much context as possible. So anyone viewing them is required to watch them in order, starting with the first. Perfect, I replied, now wearing more a more genuine smile. Although, I'd prefer if we kept orb number eight to ourselves. Homage added, and for the first time, I saw her blush. So would I, I had admitted dourly. But at the time I figured that denying them one of the orbs could undermine the notion that I have nothing to hide from them. Sadly, I still think it's so. Homage nodded. Indeed it would. Her gaze shifted off to the side. Maybe I can persuade them it isn't necessary. At least after the first pony sees it. Knowing what she could do to me, I thought that any pony would pass up the opportunity to experience that. The thought of the people enjoying Homage's attentions, meant only for me, as me, felt slimy. It was a violation that made me sick inside. This was not a sacrifice I wanted to make. But knowing how much good the secrets locked away in the hidden chambers of Ten Pony Tower could do for all of Equestria, the pony in my heart demanded it. Can I ask why? Homage questioned. I blinked. She had to know why I was willing to let the Twilight Society into my memories. Seeing my confusion, she clarified. I caught that smile. You're planning something. By the instructions, it was not just about context. Oh! I bit back a snicker. Well, that's just that those memories cover, what, two days? And it takes as long to view a memory as those events themselves. And, unlike when I lived them, these ponies will have to take breaks, stop, eat, sleep, do whatever work those ponies do, 
I struggled. I figure, if we're lucky, by the time they get to the more telling orbs, everything will be over. And if not, well, at least I will have forced a whole bunch of hoity-toity ponies in Tempony Tower to eat zebra cooking and like it. Hamid broke into a laugh. The mare threw her arms around me, hugging me so fiercely that we both fell into the small lake that had formed on the roof. I splashed her. She splashed back. The two of us lay there in the cold, pooling water, kicking waves and sprays at each other, until I could swear we were wetter than the rain was. Give up? She squealed. Absolutely not. My finishing move was to telekinetically grasp about a barrel full of water, hover it over her head. I pointed up with a hoof, and got a most delightful squeak out of her before dropping the dulge onto my homage. Okay, okay, I give up, she cried out. Slowly, we both got to our hooves. How much was shivering, dripping, her blue hair hanging straight down like a wet curtain. She was impossibly beautiful. Ready to go, Velvet's voice called out kindly from within the Sky Bandit. I turned to see Calamity had finished watching the mounting of the passenger wagon's roof, and was already harnessing himself to the front. I looked back to Homage. I've got to go. I smiled. But you will never be far. I'll be tuned in, listening to your message of hope. I gave her horn a soft kiss. DJ Pwn 3. The somber mood of our former conversation seeped back, making me sopping making my sopping coat feel all the chillier. Promise me you'll see me again. Pinkie Pie swear. The sky band had cut through the heavy mid afternoon downpour. Clement was getting a miserable drenching. He had hoof waved off Velvet Remedy's offer for a protective shield, claiming he was already as wet as he was going to get after attaching the new roof mounting. The claim was half bravado and half just being plain wrong. Now, while he said nothing, I could tell he was regretting it. Not that any of the rest of us weren't dripping wet. The passenger wagon, with its broken windows, provided only sensory protection from the elements. Soon, all the benches were soaked, and the metal floor ran with rivets of water. The tarps covering our gear kept our supplies partially dry, but water was seeping underneath and soaking the bottoms of our packs and bags. Pyrolite kept giving us miserable, mewling looks and hoots. Velvet Remedy had uh, tried using her cleansing spell to dry us over and over, but it had been an uphill battle. After about an hour, she gave up. Velvet and I were huddled together on some uh, benches in the back of the passenger wagon. Velvet Remedy's horn glowed, a soft melody seeming to pour out of it. More like that? She asked me. All I could do was nod, feeling a little stunned. Did you just come up with it now? I asked timidly. Amazed once again by how easily she could create entirely new music and have it be utterly beautiful. Well, yes, but I've had years of practice, Velvet Remedy admitted. And it's one of my natural talents. Give me a motherly look, she advised. Before I can create the music for your song, little Pip, you should really come up with some new lyrics. At least enough for me to know the rhythm and meter you wish to use. I gave a deep sigh. The idea that sounded so good in my heart last night, and so easy in the morning, and so easy in my head this morning. I wanted to create a song that expressed my feelings for homage, not something sappy, but an honest, earnest outpouring of my heart. Something that I could have Velvet Remedy perform next time I went to Ten Pony Tower, as a special gift for the disc jockey pony who had let me fall in love with her. With Velvet Remedy by my side, I had thought I could have something at least halfway decent by the time we reached Table 29. But, I'm just no good at lyrics. Coming up with words is, I sighed, really hard. Let me help, Velvet suggested, listening to what I had so far, and politely trying not to wince. Within a few hours, Velvet and I had put together a few passable lines, stringing them into what could be a full verse, 
or the two halves of different verses. I wasn't sure yet. In the warmth of your embrace, I found acceptance. And I know our moments, through all my adversities. In my darkest hour, will save and anchor me. And I will kiss the orb that holds these memories. Velvet Remedy sang my lyrics experimentally, smiling at how they came out her tongue this time. Much better, although I still think there are some other phrases, or your other phrases are a little too specific. I shook my head. This is from me to her. It's personal. It should be specific. I was being stubborn in the face of wisdom, but it was my song, and I rather liked the line, I've been crushed under the train cars of loneliness. Velvet Remedy gave me a patient and charmingly understanding smile, and I knew she would manage to talk me into changing the line before the night was over. The storm continued to escalate, the winds blowing the rain sideways and tearing at Calamity hard enough that we were stopping every hour to give him rest. Even flying, our progress had become achingly slow as Calamity continuously forced or fought to correct our course as the wind blew off blew him off path. I hated seeing him work so hard for us. The third time we landed, we were able to take shelter in the overhang of the remnants of a recharging station, somewhere in the Holocaust blasted remains of a small business community, which had once been sprawling between Manhattan and Fetlock. I spotted a mostly intact storeroom in the otherwise mostly collapsed buildings. On the door was a faded and stained poster of a genial twilight sparkle. Knowledge is magic, insisted the words above her friendly smile. In the smaller font beneath, the Ministry of Arcane Sciences is looking for a few bright minds. Together, we will save Equestria. Equally ancient graffiti scrawled across the poster. Partial words. I the mini drove me to imagine the poster had been moved, and the rest of the rebellious words left behind on a wall somewhere else. Calamity unhitched himself and trotted onto the supply room to give a good shake while the rest of us started digging through our supplies for boxes of Pony Joe's donut holes and cans of sweet potatoes which would be our dinner. I eyed the boxes dubiously. I had overcome my squeamishness of eating 200 year old food, but I had still planned to give the donut holes a pass. Calamity returned as Pyrelite was giving the cans a warming and a slightly radioactive breath bath. He was less soaked and unsurprisingly more laden with scavenged goods. I'm gonna swap out the spark batteries while we're sitting. Clement announced as Velvet Remedy magically cleaned away the rest of the water from his fur and feathers. I don't want us losing them in the middle of the storm. Velvet Remedy gasped. Don't you dare. You've already worked too hard. And now you're finally dry. You will not immediately go wallowing around in the mud under this wagon. You rest. One of them, or one of us, will change them for you. By necessity, that meant me. But I was more than happy to be volunteered. Well, Clemente looked thankful for the offer and the chance to rest his sore and aching wings. I figure maybe we oughta hunker down for a bit till the storm loosens up a little bit of its rage. We all readily agreed. I knew from experience that the rain in the Equestrian Wasteland could last for days, but I hoped the worst part would pass within a few hours. The burning white flash nearby, lightning, turned the world into stark light and black shadow. Clement looked over his shoulder and said something to me, but his words drowned out by another peeling roar of thunder that shook bits of debris from the cracks of the overhang. Minutes later, I squirmed under the sky bandit. The sloshing sliding under my body wasn't exactly mud, but a gritty mixture of water and ashes. I tried not to think of who I might be laying in. Surely, most of the ash was from the incinerated buildings, right? As I telekinetically removed the screws on the plate covering the spark battery array, I heard a familiar marching music leaking through the storm, an approaching sprite bot. The music grew louder as the floating radio drew near. The tiny, 
quality of the music more noticeable through the white noise in the rain. A burst of static killed the music. The sprite bot went silent. Hello, watcher. Hello, little pip. It's been a while. I can tell you've been busy. I laughed ruefully as I thought of just how much I'd been through since we had last spoken to Spike. How are things at your... house? I asked, an itch of paranoia preventing me from referring to the cave more directly. Are the... um... unwanted guests giving you any more trouble? Actually, they've been really quiet recently. I don't know if they're preoccupied or just avoiding the place. Changing topics, you haven't, by any chance, found any other... others, have you? Wow. This conversation was awkward. No. Not yet. But I'm looking. Thanks. We were either dancing around something, or we really had nothing to say to each other. I felt a resurgence of the pain caused by realizing that I was not the hero one that Spike had been looking for. And I was not one of the ponies who could make everything right. For a brief, sparkling moment, I had thought I knew my purpose, only to have that hope dashed against the cold racks of an unforgiving reality. But then, the Gardens of Equestria wasn't going to make everything right with the wave of a hoof and a rainbow of good intentions. Even after the purges of the taint from the world, the mutated monsters that taint had created would still be left behind. The alicorns, those things from the hospital, if any survived, blood sprites, hellhounds. Even after it washes the tin taint from the air, the world would still be trapped under the depressing bleakness of the constant cloud cover. Even though it would rid the world of radiation, it would not exercise the evil that is festered in the hearts of so many ponies. Raiders and slavers would not disappear like the poison in the soil. In short, there was so much more to do, and I didn't have to be destined to be something great or important or vital. I just had to do something good. And if I could help a little towards something as great as the Gardens of Equestria, that was just icing on the cupcake. The pauses stretched uncomfortable to uncomfortable lengths. Finally, Watcher said, Well, I guess I should be going then. Wait, I said, suddenly having a question. Can non-ponies ever be the bearer of the elements of harmony? Maybe I needed to widen my search. Oh. Uh, no, I don't think so. Oh. Well, it was worth asking. I searched my mind for anything else to say. Finally, the star spot in the room couldn't be avoided any longer. Sp- Watcher. I know what happened to Twilight Sparkle. Silence. Thunder rumbled in the background. Then... Oh. Spike was silent a little longer before finally daring. Please, tell me she went quickly, without pain. Was it fast? It was, wasn't it? A rock lodged in my throat. I felt my ears paced back. I was thankful that I was beneath the sky bandit, the passenger wagon shielding him from my expression. I opened my muzzle, but I didn't have the breath to speak. I couldn't tell him. He didn't deserve that. She was his closest friend, a sister, mother, the best friend, all in one. And the weight of this horror was too much. <clears throat> the pain of knowing now, and knowing that maybe some part of Twilight was still in the goddess, alive, but no longer herself, or even sane, <clears throat> and had not been for centuries. I realized I was going to lie to Spike. Corrupted kindness, a pony's voice hissed in my head. But it wasn't the voice of my little pony. It was the voice of the goddess. She died trying to save other ponies, Spike. It was a noble death. She died crying out a name. What was it? Was it his? And I believe she was thinking about you fondly as she passed. I think she was happy you weren't there. That she survived. It was an utter, bold-faced lie, except my face was not bold. 
and no pony would have believed me if, I had, if they had been able to see me. No dragon either, no matter how much he needed to. Another long pause. Thank you, little Pip. The mechanical voice of the sprite bot couldn't convey emotion, but I could still tell that hidden in his cave, the mighty dragon, Spike, was crying. Did you find her body? Is she buried? I felt a hard pang try to tear apart my heart. After a moment of panic, I let out a shuddered breath. No, Spike. I saw her death on a recording. But after she was dead, the goddess ate her body. Utter quietness from the sprite bot, from Watcher, from Spike. I'm going to end the goddess, I said. And this time, truth flowed in every word. And if, by some miracle, there's anything left of Twilight, I will put her to rest. <clears throat> the fury of the storm beat upon the wastelands for most of the night, finally exhausting its rage and slipping back into an almost peaceable drizzle, like a snoring yagwai. We reached Table 29 in that foreboding hour of darkness, whose name I could not remember. I gently ho told Pyrelight to stay behind to guard the Scar Bandit, considering the plethora of monsters that we had encountered in Fetlock before. It was a reasonable precaution, but in truth, I just didn't want to bring a radioactive bird into the Outcast's new home base. Outcasts. Their Steel Ranger armor, bearing stripes of red, took battle stances at our approach. I saw them tense. A moment later, soft lights erupted around us, and Velvet Remedy's satin voice rang out in the darkness. Hail, followers of Applejack! Little Pip and her entourage bid you welcome, and request an audience with Steel Hooves. Hearing Velvet Remedy refer to us like that was uncomfortable. I didn't deserve that sort of credit or attention. But more, I didn't want my friends thinking of themselves that way. Still, I watched as the outcasts rel house casts relaxed, and I was thankful for her diplomacy. Two of the former Steel Rangers trotted over to us, flanking us as they guided us towards the door to Stable 29. I recalled with a shiver my last visit here. Since then, new scorch marks littered the walls of the maintenance tunnel. Bullet case casings littered the floor, and the dark stains told of the ferocious engagements between the outcasts and the Steel Rangers as they vied for control of the stable and the Crusader computer inside. One of our escorts motioned to another guard, who stood at the control mechanism for the stable door. A cable ran from the guard's mechanically powered armor to the controls. She didn't even have to throw a switch. With a teeth hurting grind, like a hydra like hiss, the large gear shaped door was pulled open from its internal arm. We marched forward. As I set a hoof into the stable, part of me couldn't believe I was returning here. I remembered vividly the events and emotions of my previous excursion to this place. As we walked, I was relieved to see the outcasts had taken time to clear the bodies away, and young knights were making headway on the rest of the detritus that led to the floor of the atrium. My first time here, I was bothered by the wrongness of the stable's layout. It did not conform to Stable 2's, to the way a stable should be. Now, after my final visit to Stable 2, there was no such feeling. Seeing the death and destruction visited upon Stable 2 had stained its memory from me. There was no longer a proper stable. There had been fighting inside as well as out. One of the columns in the atrium, previously whole, was now smashed. The floor showed the damage of a grenade machi machine gun would cause. I spared a glance towards the clinic, shuddering a little as I remembered the atrium's guns had pinned us there. Those turrets were now replaced by models bearing the outcast's colors and three apple symbol. I wonder what Applejack would have thought of her cutie mark on turrets facing into a stable. My gaze traveled to the great tilted roof and down the catwalks that hugged plain gray walls. 
Morosely, I thought. This room needs a moral. Merle. <clears throat> the two outcasts led us up the stairs to the second level. I glanced at the bulletin board as we passed. The old messages and notices had been cleared away, and the board itself had been bleached clean. Its ghastly message, written in pony blood, existed now only in memories. In the final resting place, the vinyl scratch. The pony in my head reminded me. The tomb of the original DJ Pone 3. I quickly chose not to dwell on that. Down that path lay dark things. We walked by a couple nights, one hauling a trash can cart, the other walking behind her, chattering amiably. This place could really use some colorful posters, not to mention a few throw rugs. They used some curtains. This place isn't exactly rich with windows, said the other pony, pointedly. And I don't think Elder Steelhoos is the sort to embrace draperies. I covered a snicker with a hoof. True, but he'd probably go for the idea of posters. Good luck finding a good one for us now. All the Ministry of Wartime Technology posters just say PROGRESS and have images of tech advancements. I've never seen one poster from the from them that had featured their Ministry Mayor. As we passed, I found myself thinking of the two mayors whose ministries never bolstered their image, Applejack and Rarity. One because her ministry didn't want to give her the honor, the other because she did not wish to take the honor up for herself. Steelhoofs whose love for Applejack had never faltered, had a statuette of the mayor, be strong, in his shack. I suspected that was the best image of Applejack they would find. Instinctively, I had assumed Steelhoofs would take the overmare's office, but as our escorts turned us into the security station, I remembered Stable 29 didn't have an overmare's office. A ghostly touch of that sense of wrongness brushed back into my mind. Steelhoofs was pacing the room, speaking to a brown mare in a cropped yellow mane, whom quickly gleaned was X, Star Paladin Crossroads? She wasn't wearing Steel Ranger armor, painted or otherwise. But then, they had to take it off sometime, didn't they? Except Steelhoofs, of course. They're calling him Elder now. I thought bemusedly as I watched our former companion. Can't send a full detachment with them, Steelhoofs were arguing. That would leave Stable 29 dangerously low on defenders. I did not yet know what this was about, but I recognized the dire necessity for the outcasts to keep Stable 29. If the Steel Rangers took the stable, then all the outcasts drawn here for a refuge would be galloping into a trap. And if we send only a small honor guard, it invites an attack, Crossroads retorted evenly. We can't ask our ponies to walk into that kind of danger with insignificant numbers. Steelers disagreed. They're Applejack's rangers. Galloping into danger for the sake of another is exactly what we should expect from them, and what they should expect themselves. Any one of us should be willing to rush to the aid of the innocent, without thought for ourselves. While there are no innocents here to be saved, this is a prisoner transfer in hostile territory. This is different. Crossroads insisted, and you know that. The outcast flanking us, silently, stood at attention. I felt I should clear my throat, to announce our presence. Not out of impatience, but to make sure the two leaders of this new faction were fully aware of their discussion, that it was not in private. I didn't feel like I was politely waiting. I felt like I was eavesdropping. If the Steel Rangers open fire on our paladins, then they risk catching their own elder in the crossfire. Steelhoofs countered, but they seem to have second thoughts about this argument. Actually, if the Steel Rangers were to kill Elder Cottage Cheese in an attack, that might actually be better for us in the long run. Letting him go free is only going to borrow future trouble and death for the outcasts. Crossroads sighed and smiled reasonably. True, but we shouldn't allow ourselves to think that way. Remember, we're the good ponies. Steelers nickered in response. 
Howdy, y'all, Calamity called out. What y'all talking about? Where now? I caught Velvet purr something under her breath. Our escorts bristled a bit at the audacity of Calamity's interruption. But as Steelers and Crossroads turned to face us, Crossroads gave us a smile. And you must be Calamity, Velvet Remedy, that zebra, and, of course, Little Pip. For a moment, I glared at Steel Hooves. That zebra. Really. But then Zena spoke. Your reputation spreads, little one. My indignation deflated. There was, after all, a touch of fair turnabout at play. I didn't believe for the moment. That was why Steel Hooves referred to Zenith that way. But if I spoke up, he could argue it was, and I could not win that argument. I remember he stepped forward, and dipped her head in greeting. We are, and our zebra companion's name is Zenith. We are pleased to finally meet you, Crossroads. Steel Hooves seemed to look at us over, in lieu of a more formal and familiar reunion, then told Calamity. Elder Cottage Cheese of the Manhattan Steel Rangers is currently under house arrest. We have negotiated an agreement to return him to the Steel Rangers at Buckland Cross. Buckland Cross? I asked out of curiosity. Why don't they just come here and get him? Crossroads frowned. For the same reason, I suspect, that we are dis uh, disputing how many of our own to commit for the delivery. Elder Cottage Cheese devoted most of his knights and paladins to the assault on Stable 2 and 29. The forces holding Brooklyn or <coughs> Buckland Cross are depleted enough to explain their refusal to divide their forces. Then you hardly need to worry about them attacking here. Them, no. Steel who's play paced. Others, yes. We can expect a counter-strike by forces sent from Philadelphia at any time. Their elder was killed in Stable 2. They will not forgive that. And they may receive reinforcements from other contingents. Crossroads shook her head. Hoovington is still dark, and Trottingham is such a mess with the elder there that it would be hard-pressed to devote forces anywhere else. Unless the Steel Rangers abandon Trottingham entirely, Steel has pointed out. At this point, that might be their best strategic option, but even if they left now, it would be difficult for them to rally with the Philadelphia forces in enough time to attack before our ponies have returned. Hard, but not impossible. Clemity whined, whispering to Velvet. I almost want to tell him to get a room. I shook my head. But you know, this would be it. One of the security intercoms let out a burst of static followed by a stallion's voice. Elder Stihlu, sir, my apologies for the interruption, but Elder Cottage Cheese is demanding his medical share. In the background, I could hear the grumpy, yet cultured voice of a very elderly stallion. Still an elder, and you traitors will show proper respect. I will not be hauled back to my citadel in that capsule like a piece of luggage. I will return with my held hell high. Medical chair? I asked. Steel Hooves groaned. Crossroads trotted to the intercom switchboard, glancing briefly at the map of lights above to determine which button she needed to press to speak back to them. Bubba nobody whined softly. Oh, Pip. I wasn't sure why she had said it at first, but then I noticed which light was blinking on the map. I realized they were using the Pipa Connection stall in the maintenance wing, as a jail. I stared as the brown mare found the button, the pony in my head trying to decide how I should feel about that. I just passionately settled on, makes sense. Elder Cottage, it's raining. Crossroads nickered politely to the intercom. You would catch a cold, which you know would probably kill you. Your life support capsule is the only way we can ensure you will survive the journey. You traitorous lot have already killed me, the other retorted. 
the Crusader mainframe in this stable is my last hope, and you have ripped that from me. Whether the finishing drought be from sword, drizzle, or cup of poison, I will face my end with dignity. Crossroads took her hoof off the intercom, looking at Steel Hooves, with an expression of concern. Steel Hooves marched over, assessing the terminal, then pushed Crossroads out of the way as he pushed the intercom button. Elder Cottage Cheese. His voice rumbled at the intercom. This is Steel Hooves. This conversation is now being recorded. Please state your request again. Request. The elder responded with irritating civility. Yes. I require that my medical chair be brought here at once, and that your knights here assist me in transferring to it. I'll return to Bucking Lee Cross as a pony, not a parcel. Crossroads shook her head. We can't. Chances are he'll die. Steelers pressed the button again. You have been informed of the risk that this poses to your health. If you refuse to travel in a light support chamber, you could expire. Is that what you want? Damn you, Steel Hooves. Yes. Now bring me my goddamn chair. Steel Hooves looked back at Crossroads, and then gave a grunt of satisfaction, hitting another button. Will some pony please bring Elder Cottage Cheese his goddess damned medical chair? Steel Hooves, Crossroads gasped. But our armor and tomb companion had made his decision. He is an elder. He has the right and the authority to make his own decisions. The familiar voice of the Knight Strawberry Lemonade burst from the intercom. I'm on it! Star Paladin Crossroads looked grimly displeased with her new elder's decision. Honestly, I don't think the assisted suicide of an enemy elder is the best stone we could have laid on our movement's foundation. More tenderly, do you believe Applejack would have approved? I could feel Steel Hooves glaring radiantly from behind his visor. His response was slow and coming. I don't know. This is not the sort of decision she would have ever wanted to make. But there were probably such many such difficult decisions over the next few months, and the survival of our faction has to take priority. He added solemnly. Applejack would want us to help the ponies of the Equestrian Wasteland however we could. And we couldn't do that if we were crushed before we got our hooves under us. Little Pip, what brings you here? Stuhoves asked once his decision with Crossroads had ended and a few other interruptions had been attended to. I promised I would rejoin you, but as you can see, I have my hooves full. We need your advice. I told him. We have to go into the Cantalot ruins. We need to know what to expect, and how best to survive. Crossroads gasped. You're going... where? Why? Steelers was taken aback. Do you have a death wish, little Pip? It's not enough to throw yourself against raiders. Why are you driven to constantly find new and more extreme ways to punish yourself, risking your life and often the lives of those who follow you. That hurt. I'd do this alone if I could, but we have to get into the Ministry of Awesome in Canterlot, and I can't do that by myself. Yeah, Comedy stomped. We appreciate you're not wanting to put us in danger, Lil' Pip, but you can just cut that crap right now. And you ain't pulling another one of your solo missions. Philadelphia was still fresh on every pony's mind. How bad is what we're trying into? Velvet everybody asked. Steel Hooves gave a low nicker. Bad. But, not like it used to be. But still bad. At least, am I correct that you know where you want to go and what you have to do? The Canterlot Ruins is not a place for sightseeing. I nodded. We have two objectives. Rarity's office in the Ministry of Image, and the secure vault in the Ministry of Awesome. Steelers nodded. Good. You have that on your favor, then. Once you enter the ruins, do not let yourselves get distracted. His visor turned to stare at each one of us in turn, ending with calamity. 
Why? I asked. Concerned that Steel Hooves seem to suspect, or expect us to have trouble with that. Are there ponies still alive in the ruins who need our help? No. Steel Hooves' tone was final. There is no pony in Canterlot who would meet your definition of alive. And no pony who is looking for rescue. Well, that's ominous. Velvet Remedy whined. Zenith surprised me, saying, And those with the minds to leave Canterlot have long since fled. Those who remain then are Canterlot ghouls, but not a manner of ghoul that have sound minds. These are empty shells filled with necromantic poison, retracing the last steps of their obliterated lives. Zombies performing road tasks over and over because that is all they can remember to do. The zebra frowned deeply. Other than attack, that is one thing they all seem capable of. And they will move to slaughter any living thing whose presence they sense. Anything that is not one of them. Cantalot zombies? Velvet intoned. Lovely. Your biggest threat is the pink cloud, Steel Hoops informed us. It seeps into everything. Corrupting, decaying, killing all it touches. Over the centuries, the cloud has thinned to a mere haze. Canterlot itself mostly absorbed it like a sponge. And now, it bleeds from the walls and streets, slowly released as they decay. I nodded. This much I'd heard before. These days, it is possible to survive if you are fast and careful. Some ponies can even survive hours of exposure at a time. But taking that risk is foolish. Do not fall asleep. You will never wake up. Limit your exposure. Every second you remain outside, the cloud is seeping into you, into your lungs, and into your skin. Interiors are safe, intact buildings and tunnels, but only where the pink cloud is yet to penetrate. You will want to bring every healing potion you can lay your hands on, and drink them regularly. Their healing magic can reverse the effects of the cloud before it causes permanent damage. Do not use healing bandages. They can cause other problems. There will be pockets where the pink cloud has settled and pooled. Avoid them if you can. Dash through them with all haste if you cannot. While still only a fraction of the potency of the original cloud, such pockets will kill you in seconds. Velvet Army raised a hoof. Other problems? <clears throat> Still hoof side. I have told you why I can't leave my armor. You do not want to be wearing anything when you go into the Cantalot ruins. No protective gear is a guard against the pink cloud, and there is a chance that anything touching your coat may fuse to your skin under prolonged and extreme exposure. Little Pip, you want to carry every pony's weapons telekinetically. The rest of you, take hold of these weapons only when you need to, and are using them. Pack lightly, save for medical potions, as Little Pip will be floating your saddlebags. I was tempted to tell him that weight didn't matter, but realized that there might be some wisdom in having less objects floating around me to keep track of. <clears throat> if there aren't ponies to save, why are you so worried about us getting distracted? Cantalot don't seem the sort of place to poke round in. Because little Pip is fatally curious, Steelhoof said fa flatly. And you are a kleptomaniac. Scavenger, Clamity corrected with a flap of his wings. Steelhoof's ignored him. The Canterlot ruins suffered only a single strike. I heard rumors in the days after the apocalypse that after the shield fell, the zebra launched mega spells to finally obliterate the city. But if that is true, then those missiles never reached their destination. Canterlot is surprisingly well preserved, at least within those places the plank cloud is not touched. The city contains a wealth of treasures from the world before. Is it even possible for you two not? To get distracted? Zenith turned to Velvet Remedy. I would it would seem the task falls to us to keep our two companions 
safe from themselves. There is more, Silo's warned. The pink cloud has seeped into everything it touches, and the decay has transformed once benign objects into lethal traps. The most noteworthy of these things are the broadcasters and the sprite bots. Broadcasters? I asked. You mean the Pipbuck peripherals like the one Blackwing gave me? The mechanically armored ghoul nodded. They're all the rage amongst Canterlot's elites just before the end. Pipbucks had become the latest fashion accessory, and the broadcasters were rare enough that having one was prestigious. Stilus gave a dry, humorous laugh. Now, the pink cloud has both weakened and decayed their signals. I cannot explain how, but the static they emit has a necromantic component. If you find yourself within range of their effect, you must either destroy them or flee immediately. You do not wish to know what happens, or what hap to know how you will die if you do not. You've got to be kidding, I gasped. The danger of the Cantalot ruins had galloped past deadly and into outright insane. How was I even going to get every pony through this alive? I wish that I was. Siluf grumbled. If you are going there, then I should accompany you. You will need more than advice. You will need a guide. Some pony who knows the streets and can get you to where you need to be swiftly. I breathed a heavy sigh of relief. That means... a lot. Thank you. We really need you. We miss you too, Belveroni purred. Sulu stomped and nickered. And maybe we can help you in return, I offered. You don't need to commit any of your outcasts to deliver Elder Cottage Cheese to... where was it? Buckling Cross, Clavity answered with a grin. Lil Pip's right. We got me, and we got a Sky Bandit. We can make the trip ourselves in a half day. Crossroads, who had remained mostly silent during our reunion, spoke up. That's a splendid idea, but as much as we appreciated your offer, we couldn't possibly have you do it alone. There will need to be representatives of Applejack's Rangers present for the exchange. Steelers seemed to consider this. No. There only needs to be one, so long as that representative is appropriately high-ranking. Was it my imagination, or did he sound ever so happy? I shall go. Steel Hooves with again. The little pony in my head gave a small squee. We were together once more. The door of the security station slid open, and I stepped out into the hall. Steel hooves close to my side. Alarms went off everywhere. Wh what? I stumbled, looking around. We're under attack. Steel hooves spun on his hooves and pushed back into the security room. Star Paladin Crossroads, report. I. I don't know, sir, Crossroads said, zipping between monitors and panels of flashing lights. Perimeter secure. No hostile contact at the entrance. The outcast. Star Paladin paused. Oh, damn. The attack came from inside. I'm rooting explosions in the maintenance wing. Cottage, Shulu's growled. He threw himself to the intercom switchboard. Ponies, report. What's going on down there? No answer. Cross, bring up the tags of every pony in Stable 29 and tell me that we have a tag for Cottage's damn chair. My friends and I had re-entered the security station and stood watching as a glowing map of the stable began to light up with a tag with tag markers. I knew this preceded knew this procedure, although I had never witnessed it before. All pit bucks had a tag that allowed their wearer to be located. This was how the Overmare had intended to find Velvet Remedy, and why Velvet had tricked me tricked me into removing her pit buck. Steel Ranger armor was built with nearly the same technology. It made sense that they would have similar tracking devices. But what about every pony not wearing their armor? Like crossroads. The stable map was flooded with tags now. But two stood out. 
because they were in a stable, a section of the stable that, according to the map, didn't exist. The empty space where the Overmer's office was supposed to be. One of those two f tags flashed red. That's the Elder's chair, Cross stated. Where? I knew. The Crusader mainframe. I didn't know how he managed to get inside the room that not even Shadowhorn had known to access. But then, I knew I shouldn't be surprised. Elder Kata's cheese had clearly been in tight communication with Elder Blueberry Saber. And that Elder Citadel had been in the headquarters of Stable Tech itself. They had useful schematics of all the stables. It would be easy for them to know things about each stable that the residents themselves did not. What the hell is he trying to do? Clamity neighed. He don't have that book y'all been fussing about, does he? I'm loading myself, oh, himself, into that machine. Ain't gonna save him. No. Stuhus replied. Cottage keeps sending rangers into the Candelot ruins after that thing. But none of them have ever returned. However, I'm not sure he cares at this point. Even if I won't let him, Crosswell suggested, he may still view it as a sort of living legacy. The intercom burst was static. Elder Steelhooves, a pony's voice breathed. Elder Cottage has escaped. I can see that, Steelhooves retorted. How? His chair, lockbox held, matrix disruption grenades. Steelhooves stomped. Didn't any pony check the chair for weapons before giving it to the damned enemy? Sir, it was an elder's private lockbox, came the reply, and it was locked. Crossroads whined. You can't expect them to just abandon the respect they had given or had been ingrained into them for decades. I would have a hard time breaking into the elder's private possessions. This world needs more little pips, Steele groused. Velvet already piped up, looking at the map. Who's in there with him? Sarpello and Crossroads turned to a terminal and scanned it. Looking back to us, the brown-coated mare replied, Night Strawberry Lemonade. Steelhoofs reared. Crossroads continued to scan the terminal. Her armor spell matrix has crashed. She's paralyzed. He has a hostage. I crouched against the wall between the security station and the two VIP rooms, once belonging to Shadowhorn and Vinyl Scratch, I recalled. A security panel lay next to my hooves. I had my pipbuck plugged into the junction terminal behind it. On my pipbuck, I could see into the room with a camera, whose visuals were only available to some pony connected into this junction. Not even the security station had access to it. I saw the Crusader mainframe. A giant pillar with arms that reached out to smaller mainframes along the walls like spokes from a wheel. I could see Knight Strawberry Lemonade lying immobilized in her dead armor. Her helmet was off, revealing a very cute, youthful mare. Her coat was pink, her mane a gentle yellow. Her palette struck me as a reversal of Fluttershy's, although her mane was cropped very short better for one who constantly wears a helmet. She was glaring at the ancient, wrinkled pony with a sickly oatmeal coat sitting in a high-tech wheelchair. According to Steel Capoos, the chair had been reclaimed by the Elder from a crumbling Ministry of Peace hospital, along with several egg-shaped life support chambers and a variety of other advanced medical gear. Tubes continually fed the decrepit body of the Elder, a body kept alive only by extremes of medical science and the tenacious force of will. The Elder was fussing with a helmet covering in gems and lights attached to what I could safely assume was a Crusader Mainframe's brain transfer mapping unit. The unit was meant to be worn on the head of a pony resting in a gel tank underneath it. Cottage was being delayed by the inability to physically move himself from the chair to the tank. 
so he was unfastening the helmet. As I watched, he floated it free. The helmet levitated through the air towards his head, then stopped as it reached the length of several vital cables that still bound it to the rest of the machine. The elder started jockeying his chair, trying to move close enough for his head to reach the helmet. It occurred to me suddenly that Elder Cottage Cheese was the first, no, second unicorn I had seen amongst the Steel Rangers. The helmets weren't exactly designed for horns. I wondered if he had cut off his horn to wear the armor. It would have certainly been a design dedication to the Steel Rangers. But if so, then the horn had regrown, and I hadn't thought that could happen. If so, it was a bright spot of news for Silverbelt's future. Or, I realized, he may have just moved up through the ranks of non-armored Steel Rangers. They did, after all, have unicorns like the one whose body I found in Old Olnay's. Scribes, I think they were called. Researchers. I knew Steel Hooves was working to find a way into the room. Cottage would clearly, or certainly, try to use Strawberry Lemonade as a hostage. But knowing Steel Hooves, that wouldn't stop him. Fortunately, I had another idea. Hello, Elder Cottage Cheese, I said, speaking into the terminal. I'm Little Pip. I packed into the room to beg you not to do this. The Elder frowned, but ignored me, trying to nudge his chair into a better position next to the tank. Stop him, Strawberry Lemonade cried out. Do whatever you have to do. Gas the room. Shut up, the Elder said most amiably. Then, addressing me, he announced, Any attempts to interfere will cost this young traitor her life. I'm not a damsel in distress, the young knight bit back. I am a knight of the Applejack Rangers, and I won't be your leverage. I'd self-destruct, if I could, to stop you. First, I felt a warm pride stretching out from Strawberry Lemonade. You tell him, girl. Then blinked. Nothing I'd seen had ever suggested the Steel Ranger armor could do that. But then, I suppose that would depend on the payload of the battle saddles. But you can do nothing, the other replied coolly. So, cease your prattling. This won't save you, I told Cottage through the terminal, trying to be reasonable. You have to know that. The mind you create inside the Crusader won't actually be you. I'm aware of that, the other replied. I'm not an ignorant tribal. He tilted his, tilted and strained his neck, attempting to get the helmet to reach. He was getting close, but there were still several inches of space between the helmet and a few remaining wisps of his mane. Then, why? I asked plaintively, as my pitbuck scanned the junction terminal. My body and soul might not survive, but my mind will go on. This rebellion will fail, and when the Steel Rangers reclaim this place, my intellect will be here to guide them into future. What future? I countered. All you ponies do is raid and hoard technology. While other ponies are building a new world, you are hiding in your citadels. How much guidance does that take? You are an ignorant insect, he grunted in annoyance as he shifted plainfully in his chair. You cannot be expected to understand. Then educate me, I offered, my voice a little more curt than I would have liked. Educate yourself, he replied. Look around you. If you have the eyes and the wits to comprehend your surroundings, these tribals have no future. When you see the progress is just a brief distraction along their march to destruction. More ponies chose to be raiders and bandits and slavers that seem to flock to the dying embers of civilization. Only Red Eye has any real ambition towards creating a new world. And you have seen the depths of depravity he has fallen to in his attempts to manifest his own vision. At least Red Eye is doing something. All he is doing is stabbing a poison dagger through the heart of pony kind. Cottage shifted further, straining his neck in a way that caused him to quiver and grit his teeth in pain but he managed to get the helmet onto his head. Do you truly seek any society that evolves from the pits of misery he has created can be anything other than a degenerated, 
and vicious abomination? I cringed, fearing he might be right. But what about the Steel Rangers? What possible good could come out of the murderous thugs you have cultured? We do not have to pretend we are building a society now, Elder Kytus Chief informed me. We are just gathering what is necessary for those who will. The Steel Rangers will wait out this plague. And when you debased creatures who have no right to call yourselves ponies have finally extinguished each other, generations from now, the Steel Rangers will emerge into a world clean of you. We will rise like a phoenix from the ashes. Not the twisted blasphemy of a balefire phoenix, but a pure and true one, bringing with us all the glory and knowledge of the past to create a new world of proper ponies. And you will guide them. Yes, he grunted, starting up the scans for mental transferring mapping. You will rule them. Indeed. And what will stop you from becoming a tyrant? For that matter, what will stop you from making the same mistakes as old Equestria. All you are preserving is the knowledge and science that they had when they fell. Nothing you are saving will prevent ponies from falling again. The device began to hum. The gems on the helmet began to glow. The lights began to flash. I will, the elder claimed confidently. My intellect, my judgment, unfettered by emotion and the selfish desires that have brought ruin to ponies of the past and present. It is, in retrospect, better that I did not acquire that book. I will be wiser this way. You would be heartless, I mused sadly, lacking in compassion, lacking in any of the virtues that make ponies worth slaving. It is the virtues of our hearts that make us something good, something that can make us something great. The elder started with alarm. Wait, what are you doing? Stopping you, I told him gently. The vice president of Stable Tech gave Shadowhorn the code to shut down this crusader completely if it should ever pose a threat. I should have used them before. I'm doing so now. No! I'm truly sorry, Mr. Cottage, but there is no place in this wasteland for a cold, ever-living deposit who would rule this world through soulless vision. I sent the code. The lights of Stable 29 went dark. Footnote. Maximum level.